Hello and uh, welcome everybody to uh, today's Terra Trainer webinar. Uh, sorry for the delays due to uh, some technical issues. Uh, we are uh, two minutes too late, uh, but uh, I'm happy uh, that we have uh, the session today. The topic is virtual reality rehabilitation, the future of physical uh, therapy. So my name is Jakob Tiebel. I'm here to guide you uh, through this webinar on behalf of our new business development manager, uh, Fabian Scheffold, uh, who is unfortunately unable to attend uh, today. I have been working for TerraChainer since uh, more than eight years, and today I'm very excited um, about the results of um, uh, the cooperation with our technology partners um, from the field of virtual reality. Virtual reality has recently emerged um, as a useful adjunct and uh, to the conventional therapy by integrating evidence-based rehabilitation technologies uh, into this novel effective approach. Uh, VR-based um, therapy uh, has been shown to provide a positive learning experience and uh, to be engaging and motivating uh, for patients and from a research perspective uh, there's a growing evidence uh, that VR therapy has the potential to make uh, physical therapy more effective and also more efficient uh, for patients in future. In uh, today's webinar we are pleased uh, to present and discuss uh, three specific examples of virtual reality applications in uh, motor rehabilitation. TerraTrainer has been working uh, for some time with uh, partners who specialize in the application of VR therapy and use their technologies in combination uh, with TerraTrainer products uh, in the clinical field. And uh, this is what we uh, want to showcase and uh, discuss uh, today. At this point, uh, I would like to welcome our guest speakers uh, who fill up this webinar session with exciting content uh, today. And this is uh, once uh, Mariella Pisciotta. Uh, Mariella is the co-founder um, of uh, the startup Reality Telling. Uh, together with her co-founding partner, Rafa Lanos, uh, the company creates a 360 degree uh, augmented reality and virtual reality experiences uh, tailored to patients uh, with different conditions uh, and disease. Hi, Mariella. Um, welcome. Hopefully, we can see you. Oh, perfect. Uh, Hi, good to um, have you. Hi. Hello. Hello, Jacob. Hi. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, as Jacob said, we are a media production company. We dedicate to create a 360 and virtual reality experience for long-term hospitalized patients with the aim to reconnect them with their families and their natural environments. But let's tell you uh, how we begin. We begin as a volunteer experience with COVID at the end of 2020. We wanted to connect families and people, patients in ICU um, for the huge problem of this connection that we all know. Uh, so we basically started um, shooting families in their home and bringing through guys the home to the patients in the in the ICU and the experience was very very emotional and good because the patients started to feel at home and was a totally different experience for a video from a video call so uh, now I want to show you a brief video of our experiences so far so Jacob if you can help me with the presentation and the video to share yeah, uh, give me the chance, Maria, before we dive into it, uh, that I shortly introduce as well the other speakers and then we jump directly in your presentation, okay? Uh, sure, because please. I want to welcome uh, two, uh, two more speakers. Uh, our second speaker for today after Mariella's uh, speech is Vina uh, Sommeredi. She's the CEO uh, of New Rehab VR. Uh, the company Neuro Rehab VR is specialized uh, to help patients during rehabilitation with immersive virtual reality therapy solutions. And I say hi, Vina. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can see you now as well. And uh, ah, perfect. Good hi, everyone. 
Hi. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, and uh, last but not least, um, our third speaker um, today is Steen Peterson. And uh, Steen is the Chief Technology Officer, so the CTO of SyncSense. Uh, and SyncSense is a company that is, uh, is transforming um, traditional training equipment, for example, elliptical trainers and bicycles, uh, like our trainer Tigo, uh, into sensory stimulating and socially engaging uh, training experiences. Welcome, uh, Steen, nice to have you as well today in Correct. this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Cool. Okay, uh, enough of the preface. Uh, I think one thing is important to the audience. Uh, I would like to welcome as well warmly. Um, you have the chance to interact during the whole session. So we will have a Q&A in the end and a tiny panel discussion of approximately 10 minutes after uh, all the three uh, speeches. And uh, feel free uh, to um, to post your questions, your comments, your ideas about what you hear uh, during this hour uh, in the chat, and then we can afterwards uh, discuss this. Um, yeah, Mariella, back to you. Um, let's start. Um, you are talking about now how your uh, 360 degree virtual uh, reality bike rides help uh, recovering a semi-critical uh ill patients uh in in the rehabilitation process and we are looking forward and i try to uh share the presentation Yes, there was no audio in this short video, but this was just to give you a graphic experience of what we we do. So we have uh, several experience with patients in the Hospital del Mar in Barcelona, which is the city where we are based. And in the next slide, you can see some picture of patients and doctors and healthcare physicians, and the reaction you can see in the picture are very positive. This is because we try to um, enter in the humanization of the medical treatment, because once we enter in ICU, you as said you as volunteer experience we saw that there was a huge need a huge need of humanization since in this last year we had a lot of scientific uh, progress that increased a lot the survival rate of uh, patients but also there is a lot of um, psychological secondary side effects that are not so good like anxiety, stress and motivation in the patients that we wanted to boost through this immersive experience. So uh, now uh, we are working in several different projects as you can see in the next slides, some related with rehabilitation and some not so, so uh, related with the habilitation. So I will focus my interventions on the one that are more linked with the seminar today, which is VR rehabilitation. So uh, Jacob, if you can move on through the slides, these are other projects that we have under development. And the first project that we continue to do in this a secondary effect I will explain in a minute is close related with early rehabilitation is connecting families. So we continue to do this personalized, personalized video and we experimented a low cost model since we can go to the families and shoot the video and the, and the person in ICU can still feel the home because although COVID restrictions are not so high now, still uh, kids, elderly people, or even pets cannot enter in the ICU, and still the patients are long time from home. So we continue with this project, and we have another project, the Blue Space Project, 
that is about aquatic environment. And you can see we uh, shoot images both submarine, coastal images, or river or cascade with the aim to reduce the delirium, the anxiety, and the stress of critical ear patients. But what we found is that while with the goggles, the critical ill patients tend to move their head in all the direction and tend to interact with video. And this itself is an early rehabilitation that patients in ICU are asked. So this is why I wanted to shortly tell you about this experience that we are having. But let's go now with the bike rides that we are performing with the BMO equipment of Terra Trainer that permit, permit a rehabilitation with semi-critical patients that are still in the bed and can do rehabilitation session with arms and legs. So what we did in this case, we studied the duration of the session, the position, and the average speed, and we produced different kinds of experience for legs and for arms. So the patient, as you see in the picture, can wear the goggle while in the rehabilitation and see some iconic place they know in Barcelona. So if you click Jalcom, we can see a short video of what the patients see while in the rehabilitation. You see iconic place that all people that live in Barcelona knows. So instead of see the room, they continue, they, they, they see the sky, the sea and people. So they are much more motivating to pedaling. So now I want to briefly explain our production process. We always contact the therapist and when possible the patients so to understand what the specific situation is and how we have to create the experience. Then we produce experience which is performed through the goggles and we create a dedicated app that I will show in the next slide. And we always want to find a way to measure the effects of the, the, the experience to uh, improve the experience itself. So in this app, you can see that are all the video. So the therapist through a tablet can access to the different videos and choose what video runs for the patient and see the video at the same time the patient experience the video in 360 and see also where the attention of the patient goes. So we have a backend you can see on the right side of the, of the slide where we can see what are the preferred video, where is the heat map, so where the attention of the patient goes. And the next slide, you can see that this app permits the visualization of the same video to different patients or person at the same time. So, if you click again, Jacob, it runs a short video. So you can see the, the tablet and you can see the people, different people. So now from the month of June, we have tried this. Uh, don't worry, this was just no, uh, to show the different people can watch at the same time. We didn't try yet it with the rehabilitation, but our idea, if different patients can be connected at the same time with the goggle while in the rehabilitation, we, they can also be motivated by a competition. So, but we will see in the next month if this will be possible. By now, since the month of June, we have tried the VR experiences during the rehabilitation session with a total, we ask a total of 18 patients and um, in the Hospital del Mar, and only two patients refused. But uh, according to the therapist, these were the patients with a high grade of depression. Uh, so 16 patients said yes, and they used the BR along the three weeks session they had Monday to Friday. So we have an average of 15 sessions per patient with the use of the goggle. So the findings, empirical findings are that 100% of patients increase the motivation for the next session. Most of them expressly request VR experience every time. Some of them request a specific video. Some started to ask for a 4D element like the wind. And also the therapist at the end of the first question is asking how much time the, the session lasts. And uh, they said eight, 10 minutes. 
against the reality of 15 minutes of therapy uh, rehabilitation sessions. So they are very motivating and pedaling and they tend not to stop. So according to the preliminary finds, we have this uh, further investigation that Hospital Medemar wants to do in the next few months. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, we will have a clinical trial with 60 patients that uh, all of them can use actively the, the BMO and the rehabilitation. We will have a group with the early rehabilitation that the hospital usually does, a group with uh, that will use the BMO equipment without the VR goggles, and a group that will lose with goggles, uh, will do the rehabilitation with goggles. So um, the hospital will analyze both physical and emotional variable. The physical variable will be done through echographing and will measure the muscular mass and the mobility. The emotional variable will be measured by the standardized questionnaire and the metabolic analysis. So in the next month, we will have the findings. In the meantime, we, since this project is very innovative, we got the attention of uh, the media. If you can see in the next slides that there are a pretty much a lot of articles and some interviewed about this experience. So this gave a good visibility to all the partners involved, from the hospital to us and Terra. So these are only the first steps to us. Uh, we uh, see a lot of future possibilities that are in these next slides, because we would like to generate much more experience in different European cities. So both the patients in different cities can have access to this and also the patients all over Europe can have access to experience not only in their city but in other city. Uh, this will mean create a more robust app and also we want to create an interaction with the demo device so the speed of the video can be according to the speed of pedaling. And also we are working already with therapists to apply this kind of VR and six experience to other kind of rehabilitation with other equipments or no equipments. So all of this for us will never be possible with the help of the Hospital del Mar. So in the next slide, you simply see the acknowledgement and the thank you for all the ICU team and the rehabilitation team that opened us the door, trust us, is putting so much time and effort for the well-being of the patients. So I want to conclude with this other slide where you see a sentence of uh, Maya Angelou, an American poet, that said, people will never forget how you made them feel. So our dream at the reality telling is to make much more people feel better while they are living one of the most difficult uh, situation of their life. So thank you, this is it, by my side. Thank you, Jasper, thank for the you. support. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome, you're welcome. Thank you very much uh, for this interesting presentation. So let me jump out of this. Yeah, and we go directly over now to our second speaker. And again, um, maybe some of the audience uh, entered a bit delayed uh, to this session. Um, please, again, so this is the call to action, uh, use uh, the chat function um, uh, of this webinar uh, uh, technology uh, to ask your questions. We have a Q&A at the end and uh, feel free to enter your questions there that we can discuss it at the end of the presentations. Um, so the second uh, speech is from Vina. Vina, uh, hopefully we can see you now. Perfect stage is yours. Uh, now we come to your presentation and I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you. Show my screen. Hi, everyone. Like Jacob said, I am the CEO of Neuro Rehab VR. And thank you for making it to this webinar. And here I'm here to introduce you to the next generation of rehabilitation. So each year, 
mean, as we know, millions of people need physical therapy after suffering a neurological incident or a musculoskeletal injury. And one of our patients, Joe here, is one of them. His stroke left him paralyzed on one side and he cannot really move his fingers. But there is hope for Joe and all the millions of others. The concept of neuroplasticity suggests that your brain does have the ability to recover from a stroke. That is, the healthy parts of your brain can take over the functionality of the damaged areas, but this requires extensive physical therapy and cognitive training. So Joe, he wants to get better, but as we know, uh, physical therapy sometimes is expensive. Some clinics are really far and apart, so for a lot of patients, the transportation is a problem, especially if they're not able to drive themselves to the location. And we have realized that uh, even though if patients do make it to these therapy appointments, only 30% of patients actually attend all of their therapy appointments. And on most days, even if they get to the clinic, they're in pain or they're depressed and do not want to actually work on their therapy. And some, uh, for a lot of places, because of COVID-19, it has made a bigger impact with clinics shutting down and patients not being able to access the care that they need, and they go back on the therapy progress that they've made all along. This is uh, just a start for the U.S. Um, I, you know, for my next presentation, I will find more stats about you know, Germany and other places. But in the U.S. at least, there are only about 24 physical therapists per 100,000 Americans. But the number of people who are growing 65 and older every day is growing faster than the U.S. population. So there is a real need for physical therapists and also to make physical therapy more efficient, better, and have better outcomes than it has been all along because uh, uh, there is really hasn't been much uh, innovation in physical therapy since the 60s. So we wanted to change this and we wanted to make this better. And that is why we develop virtual reality applications, leveraging the concept of neuroplasticity. And we provide evidence-based, fun, engaging, and motivating therapy exercises. And our company started inside a neuro clinic. So we had access to physical therapists, patients every day who provided us, provided us with constant feedback so we can iterate our applications to help them. So as we started to work with these patients, we quickly realized that each of them had a whole range of functional abilities that varies vastly from somebody who suffered a stroke to a brain injury to Parkinson's to MS. So we had to create a suite of exercises that worked on people's upper extremity training, lower extremity training, balance, stress and anxiety, and as well as cognitive skills, and along with the data analytics that they would need for progress reports. So now we are able to provide a turnkey solution for a clinic that can work with all of their patient population. So here's a little video. Uh, let me know if you're able to hear the audio. If not, it's all right. I will just talk over it. I'm guessing you cannot hear the video uh, audio. So here we're working with the patient, uh, working on their upper extremity limb function, uh, along with uh, using a device with the system so that they're getting their arm weight support. So this just shows you how our device can be used with other equipment that you have in the clinic and also like uh, equipment that uh, Tele Trainer produces. So we work, and with this patient, we're working on his left limb because that's the part where he needs really help. Uh, and I will get into the neuroplastic principles: how you can isolate a limb, you know, which limb you're working on using virtual reality. So moving on, we will. There is a lot of research evidence that out there that sh shows how VR really helps with people who have had a stroke. So just to go over a couple of. Uh, quick research projects. Uh, when there was a test done for upper limb function with BR and co plus conventional therapy versus only conventional therapy, there was 15% improvement in the measurement of motor impar impairment for Fugelmeyer, and then 20% improvement in the Wolf function test, the box and block test, and also motor function when it was measured. So there is, you will see really good uh, changes in people's outcomes when they use virtual reality. And there was another study that involved 341 participants where we are replaced, some are all part of the standard rehabilitation, and then you can see that is an uh, increase in walking speed, 
better balance and also mobility, especially when it comes to the timed up on go test. We have had our own outcomes in our just using VR where we had a patient that started with about 15 seconds of timed up on go after a knee injury. And we were able to bring that down to 2.3 seconds for that patient with just after using VR for only two months. So that is you, when people are more engaged in the therapy, they're motivated and also working on functional tasks, we can see that drastic changes in outcomes. So now for next, I will dive into the neuroplasticity principles that we utilize when we build our uh, therapy applications. So according to Mayor Rubio and uh, Dwart's research paper, it shows, uh, said that if you employ six or more neuroplastic principles, when you're doing therapy with patients, it increases outcomes for the patients. And there are about 11 neuroplastic principles, and if you can just employ six of those during those therapy sessions, you will see increased outcomes. So we'll dive into how we leverage these neuroplastic principles while designing our therapy applications. So there's matched practice, dosage, and structured practice. So all of this has something in common. They have to do with the duration of the session. And as Mariela said, they were creating these scenarios depending on the duration of the session. So we follow some of the same principles. So mass practice refers slowly to like one long sessions where the patient, you know, uh, is only has little breaks uh, to do their therapy sessions. Structured practice refers to breaks between their sessions. And the dosage is the amount of time they spend partaking in therapy, which is like three times a week or four times a week. So with VR, we can make sure that they're getting the right amount of dosage, the right amount of structured practice. And then we can simply set up the VR and they can get and make sure that the environment and the scenario is for 20 minutes if that's the session that they need. So it's a very good way to make sure that they're getting the right kind of dosage and the practice that they need with the help of virtual reality. So moving on to the next principles, it is use of affected limb, task-specific practice, variable practice, and increasing difficulty. So all of these are based around the content of the therapy session. And as we know, physical therapists and occupational therapists are one of the most creative people, but sometimes even they will run out of ideas to what to do at a therapy session uh, for every patient. So that's where virtual reality comes in, and you can make sure that uh, if a patient's goal is to go grocery shopping with their grandkids after their stroke incident, or their one of their goals is to make sure that they're able to make tea, you can work on that exact specific task practice in virtual reality by recreating those scenarios, which it's really hard to get in real life. And then uh, use of affected limbs, especially for stroke patients. I know some of them uh, might end up using their non-affected limb to do the uh, therapy session, but then the therapists are trying to get them to use their affected limb. So we can solve this issue by giving, making sure that the patient only has their virtual reality uh, control in one of their hands and they are forced to use that hand to, uh, you know, you know, complete that functional task. So they can work on that affected limb or body part. And, uh, so that, you know, and what we can do in virtual reality is also we can increase or scale up their movements. So if they feel like they're actually doing more than they are, that get, motivates those patients to, you know, keep going and reach their goals. So, and with that specific practice, we can, you know, create any scenarios and variable practice. We can make sure that they're working on different types of therapy scenarios in that same session using virtual reality where you can go from a relaxing experience to a task specific experience to upper extremity training to lower extremity training. And the best part of VR that we really love is just like Mariela's you can, uh, solution, you can use the tablet in our case uh, uh, to increase or decrease the difficulty of training in real time for that patient. So if, they, if you feel like they can, you know, that's the whole point of physical therapists too, they're trying to always uh, make sure that the patient is reaching that next level with every therapy session that they do. And with our tablet, you can control that uh, very easily by increasing or decreasing the intensity of training. Uh, going to our next principles, which are stimula uh, stimulation and feedback principles. So there's multisensory stimulation, explicit feedback, implicit feedback, and avatar representations. So all of this deal with the feedback given to the patient either in real time or at the end of the session, which PTs and OTs already do. They 
you know, tell you how the patient did, if they did well, how they can do better next time. So with uh, feedback, uh, multisensory stimulation with VR, we can give haptic feedback, audio feedback, visual feedback, and also data on how they're doing. So that's so and. It, it's very, very powerful for that patient. And explicit feedback can be stated as simply as knowledge of results so that the patient after the session get exact data on how they did, maybe the, the amount, the number of steps that they walked, what's their timed up and go, and how can they can do better the next time. And implicit feedback is uh, getting that feedback audibly, physically, or even around the environment as they're working on their therapy session. So with VR, we can make all of these therapy sessions more fun, engaging, and also functional at the same time by transporting patients to maybe space, to the beach, or even the grocery store. And with the visual, tactile, and sound, they're working on different stimulus that they're getting to build body parts, and then you know helping with forming those neuroplast uh, neural pathways in their uh, brain. So with all of this feedback and also the avatar representation, we've seen people do more in virtual reality because they forget the bias of their diagnosis and their inhibitions and their anxiety for doing therapy, and we've seen them do, uh, do more. How am I on time, Jacob? Sorry? How am I on time? Oh, you have. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yes. So... Uh, I just have a few more slides to go. So this one, I just wanted to talk about one of our stroke left CVA patients who also had uh, tremors in her hand while because uh, she had early onset Parkinson's. So with this patient, we before her pre-VR integration, she was able to hold a balance only for 60 seconds with her eyes open and approximately only 30 seconds with her eyes closed, and her Berg balance score was not that good, and she had this goal of unscrewing five screws in five minutes. So after post-VR integration for a few months, we were able to, uh, she was able to hold a balance for two minutes with eyes open, which is, you know, almost 100% increase, and 60 seconds with her eyes closed. And she achieved her uh, being able to unscrew five screws in five minutes. And also we could see her as she was working on her VR therapy, we could see her tremors go down because she's working on those functional tasks. And it was amazing to see that happen. And there was also retention where her tremors really went down for you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes after her therapy sessions. So we saw this real world change happen right in front of us with these patients. And as we were building our therapy apps, one of the big things for all of our patients and us too is that transfer of you know skills from the virtual world to the real world because all of them want to be able to go back to home, do normal everyday activities. So we put a lot of effort into making sure that we are creating scenarios that people can practice inside a virtual environment and take it home. Uh, and I'll give you an example, quick example in the end of how we were able to make that happen with our patients too. And there's also a lot of research out there that says that people embody their virtual avatars as their own in the VR world. So that when they're able to see their limbs do more, that translates to the real world activities. So it's very important to take this uh, use of use this virtualness of VR to be our advantage and make sure that where there's transfer of skills from the virtual to the real world. Uh, this is just a quick example of how, you know, you can increase the intensity of training. This is one of our patients with spinal cerebral disorder, and she had some very, very amazing uh, outcomes, which I'll show in the next slide. So she heard she's working on sequencing. She had a lot of problem with coordination and also uh, movement. But here, as soon as you put her in the VR world, she's able to move side to side. She's working on her balance. She's working on her core control and all of that just with just one of our applications. So it makes such a big difference. And also now the therapist for them, especially with stroke patient, lateral shifts was something that was very hard for them to work on because um, it, and uh, bearing weight from one side to the other side with stroke patients. So with this application, they were able to do that easily. So with this spinal cerebral disorder patient, she had her onset in 1990. So she's been in therapy for a very long time. And some chronic patients like that can plateau and not actually make progress. So with her, before her VR integration, 
she could ambulate 30 feet with an assistive device and she had less than 30 seconds of standing balance. And she also had the same goal of unscrewing five screws in five minutes. But just, you know, a couple months adding VR, she was able to ambulate 210 feet, which was amazing to see that happen from 30 feet to 210 feet. And her standing balance went to from two, 30 seconds to two minutes, 30 seconds. Uh, and she made amazing progress using virtual reality. So with all of this evidence, with all the patients that we have worked with, uh, we will, you know, we have a product that is FDA registered medical device. It's a very convenient form factor. It's just the headset. You have the controllers and a tablet. So, uh, gamey and uh, and the gamified therapy is highly engaging for the patients and provides a new therapy modality for a therapist to use. And there's more than 30 years worth of research that states VR is really effective for physical therapy. And in the US, we the therapy itself is being reimbursed. And we've also built a HIPAA compliant platform so you know patients and also therapists can track their progress securely. So we'll quickly come back to our Joe who I showed in that first slide. So using virtual reality, Joe is more engaged and motivated during his therapy. And with that data analytics portal, he's able to precisely track his progress along with his therapist. And he's seen an increasing range of motion by more than 25%. He's able to hold his balance better and improve his muscle coordination and decrease sway back, which is in a lot of patients suffer with. And he's having so much fun in VR that his cardio is actually getting better and staying therapy for longer periods of time, which is a dream for physical therapists to get as much as they can out of patients in that one hour or two hours of time that they have. And because of him staying you know, therapy for longer periods of time, his cardiovascular efficiency is getting better. So he's able to do more every time he comes back to therapy and all of this leading to functional independence and a happier life for him. And with now it's slide, one minute left. Please. Okay, I'm actually almost done. Yeah. So with this slide, I just wanted to go back to how we are making a difference in the real world for patients, because that's that's all that's our goal and everybody's goal. So with this one patient right here, he is 35 years old, so young patient, spinal cord injury, and he uh, learned how to bend, reach, you know, select items and put them in the proper place using our virtual reality. So one day he came back and told me that for the first time he picked up items from his pantry. He was able to pick up items from his refrigerator. So his whole goal was being independent and he we helped him get there, uh, you know, in a small way. So that's what keeps us going. And we love doing the work with, that we do. So thank you for being here. And, you know, at New York Rehab VR, we're digitizing virtual you know, therapy. We're, we're trying to cut costs and make it more efficient so that, you know, our patients and our therapists are uh, highly engaged and that they're able to get the outcomes that they're looking for. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Vina, for this interesting presentation. So if there are any questions to Vina, uh, please feel free uh, to leave it in the chat and we can discuss it afterwards. Um, yeah, and now we come to our uh, last speech um, from Steen. Steen, you are talking about a growing elderly population and the problem with viewing them as a diagnosis. Yeah, the stage is um, yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mariella and, uh, and, and Vina. That was really great. I hope that I can build on top of it um, a little bit. So yeah, my name is Steen Peters and I'm the CTO of, uh, of SingSense. I uh, spent 10 years of my life as a physical therapist working in uh, three different countries. And, uh, and I also have a, a master's in, in software engineering. So um, I, I came to this as a, as a, as a skeptic, as, a, as a, I remain one, um, but we try our best to, uh, to build something that, that works and we are continuously doing uh, research with what we do. We're based in, uh, in Copenhagen. This picture here kind of illustrates a little bit about what we do. If you take a look at the, uh, the pedal where the patient has their foot, you'll see that there's a little device on the outside. That little device is a sensor that we make, and what this sensor does is it uses uh, machine learning to determine what equipment it's on and how fast that equipment is moving. So it can detect that not only is it on a bike, but it's also on a pedal, on the outside of a pedal, 
and it's going at so and so RPM. This information is then transmitted to the headset, and based on that information, the head, we do all sorts of things similar to what Vina and Mariella have shown already. Uh, this patient here is uh, taking a, a, a trip in a forest. Uh, and if she stops pedaling, the video stops. And if she continues pedaling, then it, then it continues. And this can be used on any, any of the main equipments that you can imagine. Um, and most of what uh, uh, Terra uh, creates. So um, I'm just going to go a little bit into the problem. And the statistics are, are Danish. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, so uh, basically, we keep hearing that uh, uh, hospitalizations and uh, institutionalizations, they go down, which is true. They're becoming shorter and shorter. But for the elderly population, that's actually not true. They, they are quite high. Uh, and they, um, they spend most of that time uh, physically inactive. It's a huge problem. And it's something that costs uh, in, in Denmark 650 million euros annually, something that causes 5,000 deaths. I'm going to show an example of, of, uh, of how that happens uh, a year. Um, and, and of course, it has uh, big uh, problems with uh, bone density and, and causes a lot of extra hospitalizations every year. And just one hospitalization is, is incredibly expensive. Um, we also have the, the fact that once they're they are hospitalized, they stop being able to perform their activities of, of daily life. So they can end up going, instead of going home, they end up in a nursing home or, or, or worse. Um, they are the bulk of people who are hospitalized or institutionalized. Over 50% of, uh, of people that are, are hospitalized are, are above the age of 65. So it is the majority of people that are elderly. Um, the the risk of re of readmission is directly linked to uh, their level of physical activity so it's easier for me to predict if a patient will be readmitted based on their level of of physical activity than it is to on based on their diagnosis it's easier for me to which is scary um it also means that the level of their physical activity also actually assists on on uh, the, the medication, the pharmacological uh, uh, effect you're going to have on the patient will also be decreased or increased based on their level of physical activity during the stay. Uh, uh, these these uh, uh, slides uh, can be shared if anybody wants the slides later, so all the references are there as, as well. Um, this is an, uh, an example, uh, Elsa, that's not her name, but we uh, saw her right at the beginning of our uh, project. Uh, as a demonstration to the team of what happens, Elsa gets uh, hospitalized based on a urinary tract infection. She spends 16 days in hospital. That's a little bit high for a urinary tract infection, but not uncommon. Its average is about 10 days, 11 days. Um, when she's finished being treated for the urinary tract infection, she's gone from her home to a nursing home. Uh, the, the trip from home to nursing home has absolutely nothing to do with the urinary tract infection. It has to do with the fact that she was lying like this for over 90% of the time that she was there. Uh, oh, I don't know what happened to my camera. Uh, and uh, yeah, so she, so she basically ends up dying six weeks after going to the nursing home. So this is again back into those 5,000 deaths a year. This is how they happen. It's amongst a very small uh, portion of the population that we get these elevated number of deaths per year. Um, and it, it doesn't have to do with the urinary tract infection. In her case, it has to do with this level. So if we can keep them active during their stays in these institutions, maybe, maybe we can do something about it. So what we started doing was making the room look a little bit more like this, where we started, again, uh, very basically putting these, uh, uh, making these sensors. Uh, putting them on on this equipment and then uh, just letting them kind of deal with themselves because although you can be involved with this as a, as a therapist and as a nurse they just don't have time for that that's the reality of being in a in a hospital so it was essential for us to make something that you can be a participant in but you don't need to be they can do it themselves uh, if need be they uh, they will uh, uh, 
yeah, they can just uh, start this up. Our device doesn't need internet. It doesn't need any of that, which is also the reality of, of a hospital. You're not going to have access to internet for the most part in most hospitals in the world. So this doesn't require any of any of those things. Um, yeah. So now we are uh, many different places, nursing homes, um, hospitals, rehabilitation centers, uh, many different uh, places, anywhere that already has training equipment, they can basically take this sensor, put it on whatever training equipment they have, and, and then uh, a VR device, and, uh, and, and there you go. So it, it, can, it's, it can scale to a huge amount of, uh, of places. So pedaling, I think uh, the previous talkers have, have uh, gone into this a little bit about how it can really improve. And it's not only pedaling, it could be a rowing machine, it could be a, 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 an elliptical machine, whatever equipment that you've also seen in the previous um, can help the, the, the patient. And I'll go into a little bit about the study that we've conducted. So we conducted a, a, a randomly controlled trial where we uh, we put we split uh, patients into some that trained with VR and some that trained without VR, and what we saw there was that there was a uh, we saw many things, but what was statistically significant was that they had an increase in well-being significantly, actually, um, where they feel uh, better, they feel more. This goes a little bit into what Vina was talking about uh, uh, as well that they actually feel uh, uh, better. Mariella talked a little bit about it as well, uh, which is a really important factor because it means that they are more willing to exercise again and, and train again. Another uh, aspect that we saw that was statistically significant was that the therapists uh, needed less uh, interventions with the patient, which meant that they could take two, three, four patients at the same time, put them in these VR uh, sessions, and then they can actually take them all at the same time instead of one at a time, which is a huge factor when you're selling to a hospital or you're selling. They need to actually be saving some time on, on, on this, and this is what this kind of shows. There was also some, uh, some indications that they pedal longer and that they burn more jewels, but um, it wasn't statistically significant because of the amount of people. This had 45 uh, patients. Uh, so we're conducting a new study now uh, with 150 patients so that we can uh, see if, uh, if we can reproduce the results and, and get it to become uh, statistically significant with a, with a large population. Then we have some anecdotal uh, evidence from studies that we conduct in order to see how well our equipment is functioning. And here we, we saw with uh, patients, this is a very small study, just six uh, patients. It's conducted by one of our customers. But what we can see here is that during uh, uh, 59 uh, training sessions, 91.5% of the sessions, the patient requested VR. The patients requested VR, uh, which uh, can show us, shows an indication that it's not just a one-off. They seem to, at least for some, they really like doing this and they want to continue doing this over a longer period. Um, so this is something that we may bring into a future uh, randomly controlled trial. And then we also saw that, uh, that the actual training time was at least as good, which is great because if it's at least as good as supervised training, which is what this, this seems to indicate, then it's, it also means that we also all have this gamified experience as a platform that we can build on, we can vary the, the, the difficulty, which is, which is what we already do. So we can, we can build on top of that. I think the previous speakers, they talked a little bit about this as well. So at another, at another site, we then, uh, we had a, a customer that had had our equipment for uh, over a year, almost two years. And we decided to conduct a little study with them where we took the equipment away for 14 days. Then we put sensors on all of their training equipment. We measured how much the training equipment was used. And then after 14 days, we gave them the equipment back. And then we measured for another 14 days to see, is it used more of the equipment? And we saw a significant increase in the use of their uh, exercise equipment. So the reason we wanted to do this with a, with a customer that already was used to using our equipment for a long time was that sometimes it can be because it's just a new thing that that's why uh, there's an increase. So we wanted to kind of eliminate that by making it a place where they 
where they, they already know how to use the equipment. Um, so this kind of indicates to us that it does actually increase the, the use of this uh, training equipment that is standing most places not being used. Um, so, so that's kind of the goal of, of what we do. So we kind of look at the value drivers of what we do as split into these categories, and that's kind of how we conduct our research so that we can increase, we believe that we increase the motivation, we increase adherence to exercise, we increase the duration that people will bike or pedal or row or whatever. Uh, uh, we increase social uh, interaction with it because we're also doing these uh, multiplayer sessions and, and multiplayer local sessions. Um, we increase uh, daily uh, activity level in the random control trial that I uh, uh, talked about earlier. We actually saw that, again, something that we're going to, to do in the new study, we saw that uh, patients who were in the VR group the rest of the day, because we were measuring them all day with sensors, we saw that the rest of the day, they actually walk significantly more than the group that without VR. This is results that are known from other studies where patients that are in, in rooms with windows will move more than patients in rooms without windows. Uh, uh, patients that see nature move more than patients that don't see nature. So, so it's, it's, it's in line with that. We increase the well-being. We have uh, good evidence for that. And then we reduce the personnel load. We also have some, some good evidence for that. So that's kind of how we see the distribution of, of, of what we do as, as adding value. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And if you have any other uh, questions, you can ask them here. But if you have questions that you forget here, please write to me, visit the website, add me on LinkedIn, um, all of these uh, nice things. Thank you. Cool. Sting, uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Yeah, and we directly can go over uh, to the discussion and the Q&A. And uh, there came some questions in. The first is uh, to Mariella. Mariella, um, one question is how you measure motivation and what experience measures um, are you using in your trials? Hello, may you hear me? Yeah, perfect. So by now, as I was saying, we, we are in the, in the first empiric trial. So uh, the motivation is about two points. One is that the patient actively asks for the VR the day after the try, uh, the first time. The, the second point is how much time they feel they are in the rehabilitation session. Well, and, and the third point, if they stop pedaling or not, they make a continuous pedaling all over the 15 minutes. These are empirical relevation that the therapist is doing right now. Once the clinical star, uh, client trial will start, uh, we will start measuring through standardized questionnaire and also these metabolomics analysis that are analysis with saliva that can measure uh, the, the level of stress so less stress about the environment, so we consider that this more motivation, but we will have the result of this in, in the next month since the clinical trial will start September, October this year. Cool. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. And um, there's another question to Vina and her presentation, how you make sure that the level of difficulty is appropriate set. And there is another question I added directly, maybe you can answer it in a sentence as well. Um, since when you did um, the FDA or since when you have the FDA approval? Can you? Oh, we cannot hear you at the moment. I think I you're myself. Muted. Okay, what about now? That's okay, it. so we have uh, FDA approval since 2019. That's when we came out with the product on the market. And with the difficulty levels, we have two ways. We do have uh, machine learning in, in some of our applications. So it changes depending on how the patient is doing and how they're performing. Uh, the environment, uh, the difficulty increases on its own. And then the other is the therapist being having full control on the patient experience in real time. They can change the intensity of training, again, depending on how the patient is doing. So there's two ways to 
increase that intensity and make sure that the each uh, environment is customized for that patient's functional level and the goals that they're trying to reach. Thank you, Vina. And uh, there is a question also for uh, Steen coming in. Uh, so what bad experience did you make uh, with uh, uh, the VR technologies compared to the usual treatment? I think this is a question we can, we can of course, discuss uh, in the panel. Maybe we, the other uh, two speakers want to say uh, as well something about this and share experiences. Uh, uh, what the question, what bad experiences? What good, but I think here, ex uh, yeah, what yeah. bad experience, or are there any exclusion criteria, or what? what is your yeah. experience okay. yeah. about so that? We, yeah. uh, um, part of the limitation and technical difficulty with VR is uh, cyber sickness. Cyber sickness can be a limiting factor, although in our patient group with the elderly, it actually seems that they're better than young people. We don't really know why. Uh, they, it seems to be about 8% of patients. We have uh, uh, almost 2,000 patients that we've uh, um, had through our, our systems. We have about 8% that uh, say they have some sort of uh, cyber sickness, but a vast majority of those, they don't have it the second and third time and are willing to do it the second and third time. So it wasn't so bad. But there is a subset of the population that cannot do it at all. Just like there's a subset of the population that cannot sit in a passenger seat in a car, this is a, a, a limiting factor um, to it. Uh, with young people, um, it seems to be a bit higher. It seems to be about 12% that uh, have these problems. It is, we don't work so much with young people, but this is just what research uh, shows that, that we do have these problems. As headsets get better, as technology gets better, this is all improving, but currently uh, it's like that. So. Uh, uh, other than that, uh, uh, there there can be some uh, some difficulties with uh, with hygiene. Uh, some of these uh, these equipments they need to be thoroughly uh, uh, cleaned. Uh, some of the, the protocols for this can be a bit difficult. Um, the yeah, so so uh, we we made a hygiene protocol together with. Uh, there's an institution here in Denmark that does those kind of things. We did a, a hygiene uh, system uh, with with them. That is uh, uh, approved, but it, it can be uh, a hassle to keep those things clean properly. Thank you, Sine. Um, and there is another question. Um, this is to all of our experts. Has any of the presenters evaluated um, the mechanism of their VR uh, intervention using brain imaging? Are there any results? brain imaging studies so far? That is actually Vina, a very to... good question. Uh, we are working with the universities, uh, one of universities that are doing exactly that, where they're trying to see what's happening with the brain when they're in when virtual reality. But I can uh, say one of my friends and also entrepreneurs, her name is Sarah Hill from helium.com. So you can uh, the product is called Story Up. They have actually done studies on how calming environments changes uh, your brain activity. So they do have studies on their website. So that's a good place to find that. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, there is one other question. And this is how many minutes of VR therapy are recommended uh, at the beginning of, of these interventions, I think this is uh, also um, uh, backlink to the, the question before with the cyber sickness. So what is your experience and recommendation uh, um, regarding the duration of the therapy? Maybe Mariella, you can say something from uh, the intensive care. This is also yeah. interesting. Yes, exactly. Our experience is that uh, 50 minutes are okay. We have the same duration, both for the blue space experiences and for the bike rides. I can tell you that at the beginning, we were thinking about 30 minutes for the blue space and 20 minutes for the rehabilitation session. But then we adjust according to what we experimented with the first videos. So I don't know if this can be a recommended length. Maybe it can be more, but just in our experience, as of now, 15 minutes are okay. 
Steam, what is your Steam and I have, yeah. uh, have yeah. different experiences, maybe. Yeah, uh, well, so what we do is uh, we recommend that the first time a patient is using the equipment, it's five minutes uh, maximum. And then they can uh, come out and talk to the therapist and the therapist, if they feel fine, then whatever, but five minutes to start with. And that uh, the first two to three times, they cannot do it without supervision, um, the, the, the patients. But we do 15 minutes as well, but we can see from data collection that you have patients that go for 45 minutes. Um, uh, when they get more experienced with it, they will sit quite a long time. And, and with our equipment, we know that um, if they've done 45 minutes, they've been pedaling for 45 minutes, right? So th instead of lying in a bed, they, 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 they've been pedaling. So if they can, some, some have no problem, can go forever uh, if they want to. I mean, there's plenty of YouTube videos that show that uh, of people spending days in VR. Cool. Thank you. There is another interesting question. So we all uh, know um, that there is this challenge point theory. So therapy shouldn't be too easy and too difficult. Um, and this was a question uh, to you, Vina, and um, how you make sure that the level of difficulty is appropriately set during the therapy and how is it dynamically adapted to the changing level uh, uh, of performance uh, uh, of the patient? So obviously our therapists do an evaluation of the patient functional level before they go into VR. So with that, we know uh, the level that they are and we already have created a few therapy plans depending on the patient diagnosis. So if it's a TBI patient or a spinal cord injury patient, depending on the level, we have a base therapy plan that we create and then our therapists that have been using VR for a long time really know how to where to start, but for newer therapists, there's a baseline to start with. So they can start there. And then depending on how the patient is doing, like I said previously, we are, some of our applications dynamically change. So it gets harder and harder to use uh, so that the, it's changing according to the patient functional level. And for others, the therapist can change that intensity of training. And one thing that we do is we also give them feedback on how they're doing. So if they're doing well, we sometimes change the environments to show, you know, you are actually doing well so that the patient gets motivated and that will motivate them to do more. So those are different ways of making sure that they're at that functional level, it's not too easy because we've had instances where we started to work with a lot of neuro patients, very low functioning patients. And then we had these spinal cord injury athletes come by and they're like, this is too easy. And they did not want to do it. So we had to make sure we built these apps that can go from very low functioning to high functioning patients easily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, one question, I think we are eight minutes over, but this, uh, the last question uh, to, um, to Mariella. Uh, Mariella um, Philip is asking, is there any evidence or research um, comparing VR with uh, world outdoor therapy? Because you told us that uh, you have uh, real outdoor videos and is there any comparison from research side? Well, actually the Blue Space project that I mentioned before the bike price is in the next months, there will be a clinical trial that will measure just this. So we will have three groups, one control group with no VR, not healing work. One group that will do healing work. So the hospital will bring physically the the patients outside, which is actually something that the Hospital Del Mar has been doing for a while. And then we enter with the VR experiences that are actually 360 real world experiences. So in the next months, we will have also the results of these clinical trials. These two clinical trials are different group of patients because are different stage, but we will run more or less at the same time. So we will have a comparison of data between the actual physical going outside and the VR. Considering that the physically going outside, the Hospital de Mar can do it because they are just in front of the sea, but this is not a typical position for an hospital. Okay, 
Thank you very much. And there was one last question. Um, could the presenters make uh, their literature reviews um, for the presentations available uh, to the audience? I think, yes, we can also uh, share uh, the slides and uh, the session is recorded. So um, I think um, uh, everybody is uh, supported from this side. And feel free, please, uh, to reach out to Terra Trainer and uh, we love to answer uh, more and further questions on this topic and also our specialist. And uh, this is the point where I want to say uh, thank you. Thank you, Mariella. Thank you, Vina. Thank you, Steen, for participating today here in this webinar. And thank you for your interesting presentations. And we are looking forward uh, to further collaboration with you. Thank you very much. And thank you to the audience. Thank you. Hopefully it was an interesting uh, interesting webinar for you and we see you soon again in uh, one of our next sessions. Goodbye everybody. Bye everybody. Thank you. Have a good day and a good week. Bye bye. Bye.